In his rookie season, steering the Cincinnati Reds, Lou Pinella unknowingly kicked off a baseball revolution, and it was beautiful to witness. Pinella had inherited a team that was not ready for prime time, then he transformed it into a formidable juggernaut. By the time he was done, the Cincinnati Reds bullpen, which included a trio of fireballers, Rob Dibble, Norm Charlton, and Randy Myers, became more than just relievers. They were downright nasty. In baseball, starters often take the spotlight, and relievers play second fiddle, but these three were different. You had to forget about conventional bullpen roles because this trio was brash, bold, and unapologetically loud. Lou Pinella had just taken over from a disgraced Pete Rose, and he brought a fresh approach with him. The Reds players confirmed that he was a relief from their former manager as he engaged more with them and cared about them. Armed with pitching stalwarts like Riho, Browning, and Jackson, Pinella faced a rotation dilemma. Armstrong, Charlton, and Mailer were his wild cards, yet he somehow knew he needed the nasty boys. And for what reason? Well, he didn't know at the time, but he was willing to bet on them. While Armstrong and Mailer brought stability with around six innings per start, Pinella also saw Charlton's bullpen potential. So despite his average starts, the coach gambled on Charlton's relief skills, and his bet paid off. Charlton, a true mound warrior, tossed an impressive 154.1 innings in 56 appearances in 1990. Plus, winning 12 games with two saves under his belt, his dominance extended from complete games to shutting down opponents in late innings. His bullpen brilliance shone in 40 relief stints, as he often entered games when the Reds needed him most, securing wins and holds while keeping runners from scoring. As Charlton dominated the seventh inning, Flamethrower Rob Dibble was gearing up for the next inning. 1990 developed into Dibble's year. He stacked up 68 appearances, 98 innings, and an impressive 136 strikeouts. Plus, with 11 saves and a stellar postseason record, he clinched a share of the NLCS MVP by silencing the Pirates and Athletics. Now, how about Dibble's bullpen partner, Randy Myers? Myers was a dominant force, too. Acquired from the Mets, Myers became a Reds asset, boasting a stingy 2.08 ERA over 86.2 two innings. Like Dibble, he also shared the 1990 NLCS MVP honors. In a nutshell, Pinella had fixed a major problem and was left with a trio that could win games for the team. Of course, individually, these guys already had great numbers between them, so maybe they just needed Pinella's guidance to point them in the right direction. To give you a better perspective of what we're talking about, let's take a deeper look at each individual. Anyone who has heard about the Nasty Boys would agree that they had personalities that matched their nickname, and each of them was unique in his own way. Rob Dibble had zero tolerance for anyone trying to steal his spotlight. Drafted in the first round back in 83, he burst onto the Cincinnati Reds scene on June 29, 1988. But it was June 4, 1989 that put him on the map. That's when he pitched an immaculate inning, striking out three Padres on nine pitches in the eighth inning of a 5-3 win. This superior level of performance helped him to secure all-star honors in 90 and 91. He also stole the show as the 1990 NLCS MVP, sharing the spotlight with his fellow nasty boy, Ray. Andy Myers. And of course, you just have to remember that unforgettable 1990 season. That year, Dibble was totally unhittable as the Reds swept the Oakland Athletics in the World Series, clinching the title in just four games. One thing's for sure, Dibble's temper matched his fastball speed, and he used that to his advantage. He etched his name in history by notching his 500th career strikeout in a mere 368 innings, an amazing achievement. But then, that fiery attitude didn't always stay on the field. It followed him into the clubhouse and caused him some troubles. From triggering bench-clearing brawls to accidental run-ins with fans, Dibble's intensity knew no bounds. However, whether it was squaring off with players like Eric Yelding and Doug Desenzo, or butting heads with manager Lou Pinella in 92, Dibble was a force to be reckoned with both on and off the field. And then there's Charlton, who was the brains of the bunch, boarding a triple major from Rice University. From fastball to curveball to forkball, he had an amazing arsenal of pitches. He became a local legend in Cincinnati during a nationally televised Sunday night game when he plowed through Mike Sosha to score a run, cementing his place in the hearts of Reds fans everywhere. But Charlton's legacy extends far beyond the Queen City, as he played crucial roles in two beloved Mariners squads. In the legendary 1995 Refused to Lose season, he stepped up as the team's closer following a mid-season trade, helping propel the Mariners to their first-ever playoff berth. And then, in 2001, as part of the squad that set a Major League record with 116 wins, Charlton took on the role of lefty specialist, adding depth to a bullpen stack 
stacked with the likes of Kazuhiro Sasaki, Jeff Nelson, and fellow Southpaw Arthur Rhodes. The last of the bunch, Myers, was the wild card who was snagged in a trade with the Mets. And you won't believe it, Myers brought literal hand grenades and a stun gun into the locker room, just for kicks. Myers came to Cincinnati in 1990, traded by the New York Mets for closer John Franco. He quickly rose to prominence as one of the league's top closers, cementing his status as the standout member of the fearsome Nasty Boys trio. In that pivotal year, he clinched his second World Series ring as the Reds swept the Oakland Athletics. But Myers wasn't just saving games, he was the leader. He was the one who coined the moniker the Nasty Boys during spring training before the 1990 season. Three men with extraordinary abilities and tempers that matched their gameplay. What do you think anyone would expect of them? Of course, they lived up to their names in more ways than you can imagine. Their dominance on the field wasn't just about wins, it was about making a statement. And when Myers celebrated, he did it big, cranking up the clubhouse stereo and blasting MC Hammer's You Can't Touch This. No doubt, it was the perfect anthem, echoing the struggle of opposing batters to even lay a finger on the Nasty Boys' deadly pitches. But in 1991, Myers faced a curveball of his own. That year, the Reds decided to shake things up, throwing him into the starter role. It was a bold move, but it backfired because Myers struggled, ending the season with a disappointing record of 6 wins and 13 losses. Yet, this determined player wasn't one to dwell on setbacks. In 1992, he reinvented himself as the Padres' closer. After a brief stint in San Diego, he traded in his uniform for the Cubbies Blue and Red in 1993, and it was this year he delivered his best career performance, smashing records with 53 saves, a feat that had the whole league buzzing. But then Myers' biggest challenge came on September 28, 1995 at Wrigley Field. In a game against the Astros, things took a wild turn when a fan named John Murray attacked Myers on the field after surrendering a crucial home run. But hey, don't panic, this player could hold his own. With lightning-fast reflexes and some martial arts moves up his sleeve, Myers managed to subdue the assailant until security could step in. The Nasty Boys weren't just a trio of arms, they were game changers, turning every nine-inning showdown into a five or six-inning nail-biter. With a mind-blowing 2.28 ERA in 338 innings, they racked up 24 wins and protected 44 victories. Dibble and Myers even snagged coveted all-star nods. Their dominance paved the way for Cincinnati's first pennant since the glory days of the Big Red Machine in 76. With them, the 90 team oozed confidence, and they went as far as dropping a rap track titled Reds Hot before clinching the championship. When the Reds faced the mighty Oakland Athletics in the World Series, skeptics lined up, betting on the defending champs, but the Cincinnati Reds had other plans. With Jose Rijo's stellar pitching, Billy Hatcher's clutch hits, and the Nasty Boys slamming the door shut, the Reds emerged victorious in a sweet four-game sweep. The fiery spirit didn't stop there. On April 11th of 1991, in a showdown against the Astros, the Nasty Boys found themselves in a major brawl. It all kicked off when Dibble, who was seeking some sort of payback, sent a message by throwing behind Houston's Eric Yelding. Enraged, Yelding charged at him, and Dibble stood his ground, glove tossed aside, ready for battle. So as Yelding hurled his helmet, chaos erupted. Players from both sides rushed in, turning the field into a battleground. At this point, it wasn't just a game any longer, it was a brawl. If you think the Nasty Boys were intimidating on the field, wait till you hear about their antics off the diamond. Before the Nasty Boys took the spotlight, Norm Charlton was already stirring up trouble. For instance, there was an incident after a tough 8-3 loss to the Mets. Things got heated, and in a post-game showdown, Charlton made a bold move by calling the New York clubhouse. Daryl Strawberry, who was the Mets' powerhouse, didn't back down. I want Juan Samuel, Charlton demanded, but Strawberry wasn't having it. If you want to fight, you'll have to deal with me. Bring three guys and we'll handle it. So Charlton, along with Browning and Jackson, marched toward the tunnel between the clubhouses, ready to face Strawberry. But thankfully, their path was blocked by a swarm of 20 stadium security personnel who redirected them back to the Cincinnati dressing room. The whole drama had started in the eighth inning when Red's Dibble hit Tim Tuffle with a pitch. Tuffle, not taking it lightly, charged the mound and threw a punch. Immediately, the benches cleared and chaos erupted on the field. And when Tuffle challenged Dibble from first base, it set off another wave of players charging onto the field, turning Shea Stadium into a battleground. It wasn't a surprise to see either of the Nasty Boys engage in a scuffle once in a while. It was a trademark that they lived up to. They didn't just do it to other teams, they did it to members of their own team. For instance, September 1992 brought a tense moment when Dibble, known for his intensity, found himself excluded from a crucial late-inning situation against the Atlanta Braves. The Reds narrowly secured a 3-2 victory in that game, and everyone was wondering why Dibble was sidelined. Manager Pinella would later inform reporters that the hot-headed player was sidelined due to a shoulder issue. But then, this presented a different narrative than what Dibble himself suggested. The pitcher hinted to the media that Pinella had not been truthful about his condition. Upon 
Upon learning of Dibble's remarks, a brief but supercharged expletive-laced altercation erupted between the player and manager in the locker room. No doubt the Nasty Boys were more than just a force on the field. They were an intimidating presence that struck fear into opponents' hearts. Truly, trouble seemed to follow them wherever they went. But hey, maybe that was all part of their winning strategy, right? To fully grasp the essence of these guys, maybe you had to be there, living through their reign of terror.